This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Dave McDonald. I'm Sam Mercier's. And I'm Nate Blyton. And we are not joined by anyone else this week. It's just the three of us. Um, we had hoped to have some uh, representative of the New York community on to talk about uh, the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy and how that's affecting the arts community in the Northeast. But you just have the three of us. And you know what? You're going to like it because we got a good show. Um, we, we're, we're talking today mostly about um, not new music things, but how general news things are affecting the music community. So our, our, our two big stories today are, as I mentioned, Hurricane Sandy and also the election. If you're living in the United States and you're listening to this on Tuesday or earlier, please go vote. Please go vote. This is this is this is not a joke. Uh, we'll we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But first, but somebody told me earlier composers are actually voting on Wednesday this year. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know what their problem was. What they the problem they had with composers? Uh, <laughs> voter suppression. That was a was voter suppression joke from Sam Rosier's, ladies and gentlemen. That's that's why that's why uh, that's why you tune into this show. I don't right. need your sympathy, Dave. Move on. <laughs> okay, let's let's move on. Um, I don't really have a particular uh, aftermath of Sandy story to start with, but um, probably the one that we have been hearing the most about is New Amsterdam Records. Would you guys agree with that? Yes. Uh, so New Amsterdam Records uh, and New Amsterdam Presents project of a, a bunch of New York area composers and performers, one of these great um, new music success stories. They're a fantastic group of entrepreneurs in the Northeast, um, group of people that you, you've, you've probably heard a lot of music from and certainly read a lot about over the last five years or so. Um, Judd Greenstein, who, who we've had on the show, uh, Missy Mazzoli, who we've had on the show, uh, Sarah Kirkland Snyder, William Brittell, Corey uh, Dargle, Corey Dargle, a lot of these the guys, um, why have, music, uh, have been involved with this, this label. Um, they over the last several months have been putting together a, f a really beautiful space in Red Hook, Brooklyn. Um, and they just had kind of like a preview kind of show there a month or two ago and we're just getting ready to uh, have a, a, a slate of performances this fall to kind of unveil their their awesome new space for everyone and show it off to everyone and then the hurricane came in and uh, of all the places in New York that were devastated by Hurricane Sandy none was as devastated I would say as Brooklyn uh, and specifically the, the Red Hook neighborhood in Brooklyn. I've been actually independent of New Amsterdam, been reading about Red Hook Brooklyn in all of the coverage uh, of Hurricane Sandy. So their space was completely destroyed. There were several feet of standing water. They Polluted um, seawater. Polluted, gross, nasty seawater. Um, this is not this is not just a plumbing thing. This is really, really nasty stuff. Um, so they lost a lot of instruments. I don't know what they, they had before the storm. They had a, a Steinway piano donated to them. Um, I don't know what the status of that Steinway is. They, I don't know they, if they've said yet. They wrote about it, and there's there's a picture of it in a big blue plastic tarp that just barely saved it. So it's, apparently the oh, Steinway it is, saved? is fine. Yeah. Oh, that's so fantastic. That's what I read yeah, one of the articles. The the first thing I read was that they weren't sure about the Steinway, but that the water level had they had they had wrapped it in a tarp, and they they did know. Okay, so it's not like the, these guys aren't dumb. They knew that there was bad stuff going to come in through Brooklyn, uh, and so they they moved a bunch of stuff out as much as they could. They put stuff up on their furniture up on risers, cinder block risers and stuff, but I guess they didn't have it high enough. Um, so uh, they they wrapped the thing in a tarp, and apparently. Uh, the water was like right up to the top of the tarp and not going over the tarp. So they got they got very lucky with the the piano, it seems. Um, but uh, they lost a lot of stuff. They lost, um, they say, about seventy percent uh, of their stock of CDs, which they hold for artists. They don't 
own the CDs. The CDs are owned by the artists themselves. Um, it's a very artist focused company. Um, and so they lost all of that stuff. They uh, lost all of their records. They lost a hard drive. Um, so they, the, it's it's been a really rough few few days to a week for the guys at New Amsterdam. So we would encourage anyone who who would like to support them to do that. They have a space on their site, uh, New Amsterdam Presents, and we'll have a link to to this. On, on the show notes for this site, soundnotion.tv slash SN, show notes for this episode will include a link to where you can go if you would like to donate to New Amsterdam. I think uh, a lot of people have been expressing um, interest in doing this. They didn't have a donation thing set up at first, and I, I get the impression that a lot of people wanted to donate to them, and so they set this up. Um, or you can just buy their records. Now, because they're very artist-focused, the company doesn't make a ton on the the records that they sell. Uh, I think I read somewhere that they they give about eighty percent of their net back to the the artists. Um, so you can, if you want to give them a little bit more, uh, donate on that site. Do you guys have any comments here? No, our hearts go out to them though. We know mm-hmm. uh, what it's like. I mean, <clears throat> what it must be like going through that after they just got it all finished and ready to go. Um, so, and we're going to make the pick of the week this week, the special new Amsterdam version. Although I don't know how much it's going to help them because as Dave said, um, it's a very artist centered. So actually 80% of the revenue from, uh, sales go to the artists. However, it will raise, uh, hopefully some awareness about the, all the good work they've done. And so when they do, uh, have their fundraisers, which I'm sure that they're still going to do at this point, um, and the series of events this fall, I'm hoping they'll figure out some way to make all that still happen. And all the hundreds and hundreds of people who will learn about their music because of us will donate because of what we did. I'm sure that's going to happen, aren't you, Dave? I am absolutely couldn't be more certain of anything in the world. Yes. Um, and, and I learned that from reading Nate Silver's 538 blog. And <laughs> <laughs> he's got some oh. predictions on this, I think, that are pretty solid. Um, yeah. so yeah, absolutely go, go do that. Um, personally, I think it's just for me a little weird to give money to a company that sells things, but they are, I think a nonprofit. Um, and they, uh, like I said, they, they are very artist focused. This is, I mean, they're not, uh, you know, getting rich off of the CDs that they sell or anything. They're doing this uh, in service of the artists and in service of the art. So um, certainly consider it. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that um, New York being hit so hard by a hurricane, um, you know, we kind of talk about the issue of of New York and its role as sort of the center of the artistic universe, you know. so it, I, I don't know that I have anything, any analysis of this other than it's interesting that it's not really that way now because the ability to make and share and use art is spread through the culture generally just because of prosperity, but even more so because of newer communication technologies. Um, it makes me think about the story they closed the stock market because they couldn't have the trading floor open, although a huge majority of the trading that actually happens doesn't happen on the trading floor anymore, you know? Yeah, right. And there's also uh, a lot of uh, misinformation uh, related to that. We saw um, we saw the, the story about the, the floor being flooded at the stock exchange and the shark in somebody's front lawn, and like none of these things are true. So, um, but we should say that while New Amsterdam is maybe the the closest and most visible group that that we see in New York that's having. Uh, problems. I guess the most visible arts group, from our perspective, right. as as new music people, that's having problems. They're certainly not the only one. There are a lot of other other groups and individuals. Not this is you know not to mention individuals that uh, are devastated by this loss. They do say uh, in this blog post um, that they they tried to get flood insurance but i don't think there are probably a lot of people that would be willing to sell you flood insurance the week before a hurricane is predicted to hit you (laughs) um so the moral of the story is 
buy insurance for all kinds of things. Uh, I, uh, I, yesterday afternoon, I was filling in for a teacher at Full Sail University, and I was filling in for the, the record label development class, and they were talking about something completely different, but I said, can we just take a moment and learn a lesson from this? By insurance, there are a lot of things that you're responsible for that you may not expect to be responsible for. And I read them a little bit of this blog post. And I said, make sure you've, you've, you've got stuff like this covered. This is really important. Um, so I don't, uh, hopefully hopefully that will have, have sunk in. Um, also, back up your stuff. If we yeah, had ads, this would be an awesome place for like a cloud backup service ad. So if you're run one of those companies and enjoy our show, you know, give me a call. Yeah. But um, uh you should you should get a cloud backup service. Back it up to the internet uh and you'll you'll never you, you'll you'll never have to worry about something like this. Well, unless the unless the storm hits your data center. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> well, hopefully you'd have it backed up in multiple locations. <laughs> multiple locations in the cloud and multiple locations locally. You should be fine, right? Yes, that's right. Oh, there we go. Um, just, just remember everything. It'll be, it'll be good. Yeah. I, I don't know the particulars of everything that was stored in this place, but New York City's West Beth Artists Housing severely damaged. Oh, yes. By that's another big one. Uh, Tell me now, more, Sam. <laughs> well, um, basically, some uh, artists have like all of their scores are stored there. Yeah. So that's a situation where you think, okay, we got all of these, you know, hard copies printed and packed away. So we're safe. And here you go. So you need well, to have hard copies and digital copies. And it's not just, um, it's not just art. It's not just composers. It's visual artists, people that had like paintings and sculptures and like where, where, where the, the object of the, art it, of art itself is a physical it's thing, thing yeah. that can be damaged by water so a lot of people had months and years of work uh ruined and it's it, it, that's that's the kind of thing that's that's irreplaceable mm -hmm. you know when 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 a storm hits new amsterdam and destroys an instrument that instrument is replaceable essentially um when when it destroys their CDs, those CD, you can make more CDs, right? You have that, that master, you can, you can have more CDs printed. Um, but when, when the actual work of art is destroyed, that's, that's really hard to, hard to deal with. So, um, a, a really tough situation and, and there are, you can, you can donate to, to them as well. We'll have a link on our, on our show notes for that. Um, do you have anything else to say about that one, Sam? No. Yeah, it's a sad story. Yeah. Also, it's interesting that uh well there is one more uh where was that? Um uh Norman Lebrecht. Oh, Marin Alsa, uh conductor of the Baltimore Symphony, um had uh her studio uh, and this is a, there are some crazy photos uh, of of this. Um the, in, in Norman Lebrecht had it, and I saw some other people with these same photos. Um, I think Lebrecht was the one that got it first. The Marin Alsop's studio roof was like pierced by an individual branch of a falling tree. Run through, so, yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's crazy looking. Um, so it's there's kind of a, a low res cell phone picture if you're in the video and if you're not you should really be in the video because it's just better um oh that was way too much <laughs> um so uh apparently this happened while it was still raining pretty heavily and so water was gushing in uh and neighbors saw this i guess maestro also was not home and neighbors saw this and rescued a bunch of scores so um thanks to them and as as you know, conductor scores are not as easily replaceable as as might first seem. They're very heavily marked up. If you've ever seen oh, a right. professional conductor, their scores look very little like the score that you buy. On. Often very colorful as well. Right. right. 
So, um, I don't know. Are there any other big storm related things that you want to talk about? Carnegie Hall had to cancel concerts because that crane that's hanging off of a building in New yeah. York, you know, that's in the area where they are. Ugh. Yeah. There are a lot of concerts and a lot of other events canceled this week. That's most of what I've heard is of friends talking on Facebook about the gig that they weren't able to play because the transportation was down or the, the venue was actually closed from power being out and things. And so if you are in a situation, if you're if you're watching or listening to this and you're in a situation where you um, have suffered some terrible misfortune due to the hurricane um, and and you you know of a of a story that we haven't talked about or uh, a, a, a place that's asking for donations for something like this that we're that we're overlooking here, send us a link. We'll add it to the show notes for this episode. Um, so that that people that are interested can find that stuff, um, because there's just, there's so much, um, and it, it's it's hard. I think it's it's hard to say that you should donate to this thing instead of this other thing, and it's really hard when the first thing is <coughs> the arts and the second thing is like getting people running water, um, but I think they're both important and they're both going to be a really important part of rebuilding these neighborhoods this i mean some of these neighborhoods are going to be going through a, a kind of a community cultural rebuilding process that is not entirely dissimilar from what we saw in yeah. hurricane katrina yeah I mean, um, there will be businesses that just pack up and leave yeah because it's too much trouble or you know etc yeah i mean i i was i was telling somebody else about this new amsterdam thing and they said they're this, this guy said they're done they're they're just done um and i hope that's not the case because they provide such a, a valuable service to our community um, just what we needed at the right time i mean it's it's exact and and they're you know doing everything right um up until last week they were looking like they were just you know, knocking everything out of the park. It, you know, anytime you you needed a, they were like the, the go to example for a group of musicians who were making it work in the real world as entrepreneurs. And uh, I I find it difficult to believe that they're not going to continue to do that in some capacity. Sure. And it's definitely best case scenario going to be a very long time before they get back to where they were. Yeah. Um, but we can all help them by going to their website and going to these blog posts and right. doing everything we do to help them get on, back on their feet. Right. Absolutely. Um, and, and they, they're certainly the, the, and, and I would say if, if anything, they will build it back better than it was before because right. talking to, uh, the, the new Amsterdam people that we've had on the show, they have learned a lot <laughs> from doing it <laughs> once. And I think they probably have some ideas about how they might be able to do it better. Um, so we, we wish them all the best. And uh, obviously, if, if you're in New York, New Jersey, um, stay safe. Mm. Um, New Jersey announced this morning. I don't know if you guys saw this. That <laughs> did you know what I'm talking. You know what I'm going to say, Sam? Yeah, you told me about it already. So New Jersey announced this morning that they are because the election is so close and there are polling places that simply do not exist anymore <laughs> that they are going to allow people to vote by email or fax. Now, I think this is crazy bananas. <laughs> <laughs> there have been people working on solving this problem for the last 10 or 15 years, at least, of how to vote remotely, how to vote from home. This is not the voting machine at your local polling place that prints out a little receipt thingy, or not, as is the case sometimes today. Um, this is like you logging on to voteforsoandso.gov and filling out your selections and hitting sub a submit button on the internet or text your response to five, three, eight, six, seven and, or something like that. Uh, yeah. and 
universally not going to work. Universally, this is not a secure solution. And I, I have, I think there are going to be a lot. Of, I mean, for the presidential race, these are not placed like New York was not really in play for the presidential race. So it's not really going to be an issue. I don't know exactly what the status of New Jersey is. Um, but I'm, so, I'm really surprised that this is going to happen. That has nothing to do with the arts, but it does have to do with uh, the election. And there are some uh, people in the arts community that are paying very close attention to um, the the election and how it will affect arts, particularly arts funding, government arts funding. Uh, and of course, the uh, the group Americans for the Arts. Uh, ha- the has a fantastic set of resources available. So if you, we talked about this last week with Drew, Drew McManus. Uh, if you missed that show, you should absolutely go back and catch it because he's excellent. Um, and he had a poll on his site about a week and a half ago now, asking if a candidate's views on the arts would sway your vote. Do you remember this, guys? Yes. Mm-hmm. And he said some on- only something like forty some odd percent of the people that read a blog about orchestra administration uh, said that it would, it would, it would sway their vote. Uh, so interesting. Yeah. Not, not well, as high as you would think, even for a, a self-selecting crowd like that. Um, maybe they're just more realistic than, than your average voter who seems to think that, you know, voting for one person over the other is going to mean that their, their gas is immediately going to go down and they're immediately going to start getting full time based on their selection of president. Right. And that's not the case. Right. Well, uh, so Americans for the Arts, uh, despite this, and I'm sure they know this, I'm sure they have their own much more sophisticated data uh, than than a, a poll embedded in a blog. Uh, they have grades that they have published, and Drew published these on, on Adaptation this week, uh, for every congressman in the United States as uh, from from a plus to f uh, about their uh their their previous votes on arts funding yes uh so you go to this website it looks like this you have to know what your congressional district is who your congressperson is um so i live in florida so here's me and um, my representative is this guy, Daniel Webster. Uh, and he has a zero. So <laughs> I didn't vote for him. I voted last week. Uh, but it wasn't because of that. <laughs> so if you are curious as, as to how your elected representatives have voted in the past... Um, for arts funding, you should check out uh, artsactionfund.org. We'll have a link to this congressional report card as well. Um, my representative has an F. Uh, I think we found Nate's and Sam's representatives in Michigan before we started. They F. both had Fs. Michelle uh, hey, Bachman has an F too. Big surprise. And I think Nate made an interesting observation. <laughs> <laughs> I was making a joke. All the all the. All the ones with the D in the with the D's next to the name seem to do pretty well, and all the R's all got F's. On it. <laughs> it's a strange correlation. I don't know. This is not a political show, but so I, I, what I think I wonder, that's a prescient I, observation. I haven't gone deep enough into this to see how how they're graded. Like, what do you know much about what they? I'm I I this is I assume based on their previous votes when arts funding has come up in the past would be would be my guess you can <laughs> also like, one of them new york robert turner got an incomplete <laughs> right can you can you get an Show extension up. on that assignment yeah right because you know I, I i was i was busy that day my my dog ate my arts funding homework <laughs> oh. Uh, Americans with the Arts also has a similar report card for the two major party presidential candidates. Um, le- I can't imagine why, but they left out Gary Johnson. Um, who I read this week has like a 5 or 6%, uh, is polling at 5 or 6% in Ohio, which is remarkable. Uh, yeah. That's not the point of this, this conversation, though. Um, 
and you can go down their uh their two uh the two candidates columns they are graded on whether they would maintain or increase federal support for the NEA and the NEH. Um, they would maintain or increase federal support for museums and libraries, for public broadcasting, um, Title I Ryan funding, which includes eligibility for arts education. Uh, Paul Ryan, yes, does indeed want to get rid of the department at all. Uh, so Institute of Museum and Library Services. Yes, I mean, so this there's and this this happens a lot uh, in throughout these, and they're all cited. This is the, this is my favorite part of this is that they all have citations and uh, they all have links to where where they were uh, orig- wh- where this data comes from. So this is this is what the internet's good for, right? This is where like hyperlinks were invented was for citing sources for things. Um, okay. So. Check that that report card out. We'll have links to both of those, and those are both uh, from the Americans for the Arts. Do you have any thoughts, Sam? Well, it's it's interesting to look at, and I think it's telling. However, it's also frustrating because, like, if you talk about we're going to maintain um, funding for the National Endowment for the Arts and Humanities, I think there's a bigger question that can never get addressed because the fight is over, you know, whether or not to give them money. That I think we need to start talking about how to spend the money more intelligently. Um, what do you and mean? Get more bang for our buck. Um, what do you mean? Well, um, are we convinced that we're getting the most, like, sort of cultural return for the money we give the NEA or the NEH? How do you measure that? I don't know. But see, that's a very important question, other than just they are or aren't going to get more or less money. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I don't doubt that there's not a way that we could do this that would have different... I mean, there, there are certainly a lot of ways we could we could use money that achieves different outcomes, but whether those outcomes are objectively better or objectively worse than what we're doing now, I think is is... You'd have a a hard time convincing me of that. Mm-hmm. Um, there, are, we we could certainly say that we want to support smaller institution institutions. Um, we could say cap the grants at a certain level. Um, there have been a lot of changes in the way the NEA funds arts over the decades since its its inception. Um, I mean, obviously, over the last. I guess 30 year, 30 years or so, um, they, they haven't had individual grants. Individual artists don't get grants directly from the NEA right. anymore. They get grants from organizations that some get money from the NEA. Um, so I'm not sure what, what would you do differently, Sam? What would you like to see? Well, if I were in a presidential race and I had to say, am I going to continue funding or... or you really think this is an issue that's going to be a big part of a presidential race? Right. No, but it is it's if, not. You're, if you're running. It's used as... The thing is, the amount of money is so small, it's used as a, a troop rallying cry. Right. But right. it doesn't really make any difference. It's the same way as the Big Bird crap, you know? It, that, that amount of money they're discussing doesn't make any difference in the big scheme of the, the national budget, but it's something that you can latch onto and throw at people so that they can get mad over it. Um, right. And, and the, the problem is though, I, it, when you, when you say that, cause the budget is still a little over a hundred million dollars, but uh-huh. in the grand scheme of the U S government or even larger, the, the U S uh, GDP is really, really tiny, but tiny. to normal people, $130 million sounds like a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, but True. consider that that's, you know, divide that amongst all the people in the United States that consider themselves to be arts professionals. That's like, you know, a nickel for each of us. Right. Um, so I would say here here is an argument for a, 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 a possible argument for a secretary of culture. Didn't we have this discussion? We've one day had this show? discussion and I'm not sure that would fix anything, but go ahead. It's I'll, a possible argument, I said. Okay. But anyway. Um, we're having, if, if I had to say, will I, or won't I continue funding, uh, NEA and NEH, of course I would say yes. However, if I had the power to do so, I would want to know 
what they're spending their money on and what we're getting in return. I mean, you can ask them that now. Do you, I don't think a do you think a secretary of culture is going to change the accountability of government funding for the arts? I don't know. I mean, it's nice to say here's the dude, but now we've got the NEH here, Rocco Landisman. Mm-hmm. You know what? I mean, it's this is not going to change. That there's a person, I mean, the Secretary of Culture sounds neater than Chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts. It's a snappier, sexier Snappy, yeah. title. But. All right, Dave, you, you've done it. I'm going to start investigating what the NEA actually spends their money on, and I'll give you a report later. All I'm right. sure there's a graph out there somewhere. I'll tell you yeah, what can I would you, change. Can you express your, your findings in the form of an infographic? <laughs> Pie chart. <laughs> I was going to express my findings in the form of a rock opera. Can you express hey. your findings Based in the, the form of an interpretive dance? Show called Cop Rock. <laughs> I didn't hear what you said, Dave. I was going to say interpretive dance. Interpre- yeah. No way. Um, but you know we're, we're joking about it. But it is, it, it is a serious thing. Um, and, and we talked about an article of few months to a year ago uh, from an artist proposing that we just screw it get rid of the nea find our funding through donations and other sources um because it's such a political cudgel that it's its value is not worth the uh the anchor dragging around the necks of liberals in government uh you know and and, like and I, said, I think there's sim- there's certainly an argument to be made there that the amount of good that it does simply because it doesn't I mean it doesn't have a lot of resources uh, is not doesn't match the difficulty that it it, it proposes politically to people that like it. Um, what do you say, Sam? Well, I just think we're getting precious. It's it's we're getting precious little money for arts already so we need to be very careful about what happens to the money that we so do. what's another 130 million <laughs> see what uh, i'm saying the nea spent <laughs> the nea expects to spend 25 million on state political campaigns okay what is that so Whoops, that's the wrong NEA. NEA. That's National Education Association. I was like, they couldn't possibly be doing that, could they? (laughs) Why don't you report back to us later with that, Sam? (laughs) Yeah, why don't you uh, do some research not while we're (laughs) doing the show? I am. Hey, I'm I'm not holding anything up. I'm just saying. (laughs) Um... Should we move on to what I think is truly the, the, the really important story of the week? Oh, well, you're missing something. Those guys need a need a need a shout out. Oh yes, uh, Topos. So we were doing the show live last week, and we were talking. Um, we were talking to Drew about that poll, and live during the show, we got a tweet um, from Topos, uh, which is, uh, well, you know, I'm not exactly sure what they do. They seem to be some kind of think tank. Uh, their their goal is to. Uh, Educate the community and raise the political presence of the arts by education and outreach by, like, not just talking but demonstrating the ways that art can have positive um, sort of, you know, pocketbook effects. Like, they're they're not – from what I've read so far, it seems like they're they're not under any kind of illusions about what people are willing – to do regarding you know money right uh, and all, all i make, read about them i what i like about what them from what i read is that they're very practical yeah they're not they're, they're they're they they talk about they talk in terms of hard data they talk they 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 linked us to um one of their own studies uh about people's views on the arts and how that affects their their um their views on on politics and voting and um, how we can fix arts advocacy? Yeah, they're very they're very ambitious, but I think yeah. also very practical. And see, that's that's what we were just talking about was fixing arts advocacy. Sure. Um, I don't. The name I don't of know their, if arts advocacy is broken. I guess, but 
Maybe the, it is. The name of the study, which I've kind of looked at a little bit, the arts ripple effect, a research-based strategy to build shared responsibility for the arts. It's a PDF you can look at. And we'll have a link, and it kind of lays out their whole platform. So thanks anyway, to Topos or wh whoever at Topos was watching the show last week. Uh, I hope you didn't try to watch us live this week because we're at a weird time this week um, because we were trying to get a New York person on. But that's okay. Uh, now can we move on to the really important story, Sam? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this just like every week we get closer and closer to a morning drive time crappy radio show. We're going to have a soundboard. Before we're going to like we're literally a month away from having a soundboard. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So here's a better idea. We don't get a soundboard, <laughs> and we just make Sam make all the sounds with his mouth. Shum on! <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so uh, let's say that those impressions are not enough. Uh, Sam, what? what, do you, what that do you... was dead on. Anybody who doesn't have it already by now. All right, be... tell me Wait, more. Is, yeah, walk, walk backwards for us, but look like you're walking <laughs> forwards. Will you do it? <laughs> 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 See if people catch on. All right. Hey man, I saw that performance live at like the 86 Grammys or whatever it was. And I can tell you, I was like 13 or something and I was blown away. <laughs> like completely. Me and my cousin did the nothing moonwalk. to next week but try and figure out how to moonwalk. Yeah. <laughs> so so the, the king of pop. The uh, Pittsburgh Symphony is doing a king of pop show. All Michael Jackson music. Next week. Yes. Uh, mega uh, from uh, including the Jackson five all the way to his mega hit album thriller. So, uh, you know, if they sell a lot of tickets, more power to them for whoring out more power to them, more power to them. Yeah. So I'm not saying they're not whoring out, but I'm saying more power to them if they make some money. So I, I'm, I'm wondering how you feel about, cause if this is successful though, why wouldn't they just do this all the time? Like if they can if they can do the music of Michael Jackson and video game music and Looney Tunes shows and uh, Lord of the Rings synced with the film and all these things that orchestras do that are very successful, why why don't they just do those all the time? I think this calls for the founda founding founding of the MJ Phil is what we need. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We need a special <laughs> orchestra just to play the music of of, of Michael Jackson. We're in group, yeah. Yeah. All right. If I had to listen, if I had to pick between an all Mozart concert and an all Michael Jackson concert, I would take Michael Jackson in a heartbeat. Well, <laughs> I, I would, I would, I would be with you most of the time as well. I think. Um, I'm wondering who, who, like, where these arrangements are from. Well, see, you said this maybe is... they should just do that all the time, and and as long, if they want to pay me to do arrangements, I think they should do it all the time. There you go. Well, I don't. Okay. I. <laughs> The arrangements could be terrible, or they could be incredible. They could certainly hope like, for the latter. Yeah. I would, I would hope that they're great, but it would be so easy to make them awful. We're talking about music that Quincy Jones had a hand in making most of the time, you know. So it's gonna, it's gonna have some stuff that can yeah. be have stuff done to it and be cool. Yeah, gotta but, like a good can, you, can also, you express that without using the word stuff? It, <laughs> it's gonna have. It's going to have... Uh, it's going to get no, all I stuffy. I can't and... do it, Dave. Yeah. All right. It, it, the idea of doing an arrangement of a uh, Michael Jackson song sounds pretty fun, as long as mm -hmm. it's not too long. <laughs> so if you're in Pittsburgh, I know what you're doing next weekend. That's right. Which Michael Jackson song would you like to do an orchestral arrangement of is the question. Ooh. Hmm. Now, the press... The press for the the thing uh, for this concert specifically mentions ABC. Yeah, and I think that older Jackson Five kind of discoy stuff I think would be a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think, Sam? I would do Human Nature. Hmm. You have to cut. listen to the song. It's got some it's stuff. It's a deep that, cut. <laughs> <laughs> some of the some the, some of the, the way the song it's it's texturally and timbrally interesting already. And yeah. to me, some of the parts that get that way, you could go, 
you know, make that sort of timbrely rich sound with the orchestra right there and get it pretty weird, I think, too, actually, and get away with it because it's still grooving. Nate? Yeah. To me, that would be the key thing, like, of just really playing with the texture changes. What would your pick a, be, Nate? Uh, yeah, I don't know. This one, I don't, I don't know the name of it. it. It's just the one that's popping into my head because it starts with these like violins going. Oh, it's, it's a... got. That's a, that's a great melody. I don't know. Where I, I don't know any of the words clearly, but. To the sound you clearly have you? a really strong yeah you, you clearly have a really strong memory of this thing except for all the Any words <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I know the one you're talking about though it's nice um yeah. and, and so our fans our, our dozens of fans out there your job is to a uh, tell us what song was that that nate was singing and b um tell us what your michael jackson arrangement would be yes. if you got the right one for the uh pittsburgh symphony and then write it it's probably, <laughs> it's probably don't stop. Yeah, yeah. Don't yes, stop so that's exactly what it is. Yes, that would be an awesome cool. one. I think Nate wins. <laughs> that's got lots of cool rhythmic stuff in it. Yeah, but so like all the texture changes, that would be key. Because like, I, I mean, the orchestra is such a different in instrument than all the production stuff that Michael Jackson did. So Yeah, because yeah. they'll do like that hook. And then it'll hit like da 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 kind of thing. Blighten you know? with don't stop for the win. Um I think it's time, Sam. You get you get one shot at this. The pig pig of the win. <laughs> That's my favorite so far, I think. That was a good one. I like that. I went with some natural reverberance in addition to... Oh, we got that on video. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so our pick of the week, as we said earlier, is going to be from our friends at New Amsterdam Records. Uh, and if you buy it, you will be supporting them uh, at least a little bit in that last 20% that was remaining. Um, and you can also donate to them, of course. Uh, there are a lot of... So going back through their catalog and uh, looking for something to use for the pick of the week was interesting because we've already used about I don't know a quarter of their catalog <laughs> as the pick of the week before um, and and we it's not like we tried to do that you know we, we just you know finding good stuff that's pretty recent and we happen to find a lot of their stuff um, and the one that, that we went with seemed appropriate uh, it's called the Katrina Ballads and um this is, I've lost the page that I wrote down. Ted Hearn, is that correct? Ugh, I'm a terrible host. Fire Ted me Hearn. now. Ted Hearn, did I get it right? New York composer Ted Hearn. Thank you. Hour long dramatic song cycle. Thank you. Period. Yeah. So we have a song cycle by Ted Hearn called Katrina Ballads, and it is a uh, chamber cycle. So it's just a a little bit bigger instrumentation. It's not just piano, and there are actually several different singers at different points um, based on all kinds of stories surrounding uh, Hurricane Katrina. And we had some discussions about which one to play. So I think we're going to play maybe a couple of different selections or at least excerpts from selections. Excerpts of excerpts? Can, is that a thing? Can I do that? Are um, you playing our favorite one first, Dave? I think I'm going to save that for last. Okay, well, there's one in here that uses such subtle word painting with the text and the way it harmony with the music you know you just you just wait till you hear it <laughs> i don't think word painting means what you think it means i, I don't think subtle i'm is. trying to talk about i don't it. think subtle means what you think it means either um <laughs> although i see what you're doing <laughs> but uh so the text for this which i think is very cool is um uh first person accounts of hurricane katrina some uh pretty important figures this this uh are very visible ones at least uh the first excerpt we're going to listen to is anderson cooper and mary landrew uh which is a pretty interesting little excerpt so the texts here are things that anderson cooper and mary landrew actually said um in 2005 about hurricane katrina so this is uh an excerpt from ted hearn's katrina ballads Thank you. 
Senator. I oh, appreciate your joining us tonight. Does the federal government bear responsibility for what is happening right now? Should they apologize for what is happening now? Anderson, there will be plenty of time to discuss all of those issues about why and how and what and if. But Anderson, as you understand, and all of the producers and directors of CNN and the news networks, this situation is very serious. And it's going to demand all of our full attention through the hours, through the nights, through the days. Let me just say a few things. Think quickly. So you can see that this is uh, a really interesting use of the text. This is just very conversational. This literally transcript from CNN of Anderson Coover in interviewing Senator Landrieu. Um, so very cool stuff. Um, what do you guys, what do you guys think of, of this kind of use of texts? I like it. I mean, if it's going to be something that, that has some sort of really direct cultural connection, um, you should go out of your way to make sure it's intelligible unless whatever your artistic and aesthetic goals are mean you shouldn't. But, mm -hmm. you know, I think they're wanting us to hear what they're saying, and it's may, it's very clear when you're listening to it. it. But but not, you know, and it's also interesting. There's something going on to keep it interesting, but very clearly stated text. Yes, like it's it. set in a very conversational way, too. It's not um, overly stylized for Have music. Have to turn the slow cooker down. <laughs> <laughs> that is not an example of the text from this song cycle. Um, yeah. I also like, uh, I, I really like this music for a lot of different reasons. Um, and I think they're doing a good thing with the precedent set by groups like God will tune, tune the news yeah. and things like that, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's true. It, it is, it is uh, a, a little bit reminiscent of the kinds of YouTube videos that, that were popular uh, over the last few years, auto tune the news. <laughs> Uh, and, um, I, I think it's, it's interesting that it's using not just texts from real people, not just conversational texts, but texts from people that, you know, like this, this is called Anderson Cooper and Mary Landrew. And I have an image in my head of Anderson Cooper and Mary Landrew, um, you know, because they were uh, obviously both of them were on television all the time, and at least Cooper still is. Um, <clears throat> so it's it's an interesting thing to deal with such um, familiar people and familiar topics to the audience. And again, you, Sam, you mentioned how intelligible the text is, and I think that's not only the setting it's also the performance in this recording yeah. um the the singers are kind of they're a little bit more broadway kind of singing where the text is very clearly stated um because the text is very important and we're gonna here's let's stop putting it i'm not gonna put it off any longer um here is perhaps the single most famous soundbite from the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina uh, set to music. And I think very successfully. And it's, 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 you may hear this and laugh. I certainly did because of the, uh, the nature of the text. Um, but it is set very, very interestingly. And the music independent of how cool the text is, is really well done. I like it. So, um, here is yet another excerpt. This is, again, this is Ted Hearn's Katrina Ballads. Brownie, you're doing a heck of a job. Brownie, you're doing a heck of a job. Brownie, brownie, you're doing a heck of a job. Brownie, but brownie, you're doing a heck of a job. Brownie, brownie, but brownie, you're 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 brownie, 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 brownie,
brownie, your brownie, your brownie, brownie, brown, brownie, you're doing a heck of a job. Brownie, 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 so that is a little bit of Brownie, you're doing a heck of a job um, <laughs> from Ted Hearn's <laughs> Katrina Ballads. This is an album, again, if you're if you're just joining us, which I don't see how that's possible because of the nature <laughs> of the way we do this. But if you're just joining us, uh, this is uh, uh, an album released by New Amsterdam Records. So if you buy it, you'll be supporting them and helping them to, um, in some small way, rebuild their 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 new space that they were just setting up that was just destroyed by not hurricane katrina but hurricane sandy so um what do you what do you guys think of brownie you're doing a heck of a job and it's so if you're gonna take on the idea of like government cronyism like there's nothing to do because you can't fix it as your position as a composer so kind of making it into something completely ridiculous that way and and don't use anything besides just that one phrase, which is sort of like, you know, distilled cronyism, you know, yeah. and what you get as a result. Well, Instead of somebody who knows what they're doing, some guy who gave money at the right time and shook hands and glad handed you or whatever, you know. And that, that's kind of my favorite part of the fact that it's so repetitive and just on that one sentence is because that's the way we all experienced that soundbite. Yeah. Right. We all experienced hearing that soundbite excerpted from a a much longer, a much larger context. Um, Right. And I mean, it was a dumb thing to say. There's no context unless, other than, the thing that I'm about to say is the opposite of what I mean. That could make (laughs) that that make that sense, make that thing make sense in context. But um, we we heard it so often. Uh, isn't it? This just got a little political again all of a sudden. So yeah. happy election week. Um, it's it matches. I think the 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 way it's used in this song matches the way we experienced it in real life. In you know yeah. the media that we were consuming seven years ago. Though this was not written this year. Um, so I don't know. What do you what do you guys think? Big fan. Big, Big fan, fan of that piece. Yeah, and not just because, stuff. you know, it's got the funny line that has the political context, but it's just cool. Yeah, like yeah. Uh, the the it's sort of like you know, uh, sounds a little bit like big band music there, kind of, you know, for a while. I like it, and that's that's no that's no joke. Got to get got to hit your spot right for the singer there. Oh yeah, because if you don't hit those hits, like the first time it does that crazy hit, it's like he. It's like a wham, and then he does like a just a dyad thing, unison with a piano or something. Like that was really unexpected, and if it doesn't happen, you know, that's a really big thing. So <laughs> kudos to the singer. There's at least one singer, two singers on the planet that can count. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you should absolutely take a minute to go buy to check at least consider buying this thing. Check it out. Uh, NewAmsterdamRecords.com. We'll have a link uh, to where you can buy it from Amazon or iTunes. Um, uh, so, hey, so, and I'm gonna throw some uh, in the show notes. I'm gonna throw some extra secondary picks of the week just to review. Yeah, because we're trying to help New Amsterdam out. Mm-hmm. Um, so if there's anything I, in New Amsterdam you've been putting off buying, wait no more. We, we have featured a thousand tongues for singing cellist by Missy Mazzoli. There you go. Uh, Requiem by Gregory Spears. I had forgotten about that one. It was a cool piece. Yes. Yeah. Uh, 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 the album called Beautiful Mechanical, which features a, 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 a large selection of artists, including Judd Greenstein, um, by Y Music Ensemble, which is a group that does a lot of like, uh, you know, the indie group, indie rock groups that seem to end up with horn sections all the time. That Y Music group does a lot of that stuff. Um, Change by Judd Greenstein, one of the founders of New Amsterdam. Uh, Last Words from Texas by Corey Dargle. And although my new Amsterdam search didn't bring it up, we also did uh, The Same Day Every Year, which is from an EP called Someone Will Take Care of Me. Every day is the same day. 
Is yeah, every day of. is the same day by Corey Dargle from the EP. Someone will take care of me. That's a different, That's a different thing. thing. Oh, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, he's got a lot of stuff, and his stuff is really cool. Uh, we've also from New Amsterdam. That's not even all of it. Uh, we talked about Build, uh, mm-hmm. which is a string quartet album. We talked about uh, the Kiara string quartets album, Jefferson Friedman quartets. There's a, a There's lot a, of good uh, stuff here. So um, uh, even if you already have a lot of New Amsterdam stuff, you should go buy some more. You can always have always some more good stuff, right? right. And if you're like new to New Amsterdam Records, it ranges from, um, you know, like very classical composery sounding even all the way up to super weird indie artist that's just one guy and a synthesizer and a microphone kind of stuff yeah yeah they do a they do really nice really job sam uh, getting sam. feedback again um uh, they do a really nice job uh, of uh, kind of straddling strat- the boundary, boundary between the kind of music that we normally talk about and pop music and kind of singer songwriter stuff so it's very cool and they're they're worth supporting so take a minute Take a couple of bucks and and definitely do that this week. Um, uh, is that it? Do we, should we wrap up? Sounds good. Good. Sam gave me the the slit your throat, throat <laughs> cut off <laughs> thing. Sam, I'm still Sam, getting some feedback from you, so could you curtains. mute when you're not talking? That's going to do it for this week's Sound Notion. Thank you so much for joining us. We didn't do this show live because of our weird scheduling thing, but normally we do this show live every Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. You can join us at soundnotion.tv slash live, and we're we're watching the chat when we do that, so you can participate in the conversation there. Uh, you can, as Topos did, tweet us at Sound Notion, or, of course, you can tweet us all individually. I'm at Dave McDow. Sam is at Housegoy. Nate is at a Nate Tree. Uh, which I think is very creative. I, I, I've, I've always admired your Twitter <laughs> handle, Nate. Um, yes, it's hard to remember, though. So, um, so, Dave, one quick thing. I've been meaning to say this. Don't give me that face, Dave. I'm not, I'm not giving you a face. I've been I'm meaning to say this for weeks because there's been an earth-shattering change in the new music world. And I can't believe it took me this long to get around to it. The, the original uh, creditscore.com band is back in the house. <laughs> they have replaced that lame... ReplacementCreditScore.com band. So the originals are back. So and our fans demand to know. And thank God we have that kind of information no, at our fingertips. I'll sleep easier tonight. All right. So now that we've got that cleared up, uh, continue this conversation with us on the social network things. Uh, normally, this is the part where I shamelessly beg you to give us money, but don't give us money this week. Give uh, give your money to people that actually need it. Give it to uh, the Red Cross or people that are helping people get get by in New York and New Jersey, or you know, give your money to the good folks at New Amsterdam Records. Again, we'll have a link uh, on our site where you can do that. Um, if you do want to buy stuff through Amazon, of course, you can still do that, and I would still encourage you to do that through the search box on our site site soundnotion.tv uh, and again we get a small commission from that but it costs you nothing extra this show and all our shows are available in the itunes store so be sure to go there subscribe for free catch every episode downloaded to your favorite downloading and listening device uh, and uh, it's a very convenient way to keep up on all things sound notion um, sound notions introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lepp. Thanks again for watching. Be sure to come back next week. We'll be talking with, uh, percussionist, Robert Patterson, who has developed an excellent six mallet marimba technique of his own. Uh, and we'll be listening to some of his new music from a new album of music that he wrote for his crazy six mallet marimba thing. Uh, so I'll see you back next week. <laughs>